I'm going to be doing, a, a, it's called a dry dye demo, not because the process was dry at the time it was being dyed, but because it's, it's dry now. Each dye session is um, a very unique experience, but when you're doing a dye demonstration, it's like you want to show a little bit of everything, and so I was Jekyll and Hyde. If I did it before Christmas, I have no idea what they look like, I haven't peeked, and if they're horrible, you'll be kind. <laughs> I'd like to know now, how many people know what Arashi Shibori is? Two. Maybe, maybe I should explain. Um, so Shibori, think tie-dye from Japan. In other countries, it would have a different name, but it's essentially um, resisting the fabric in multiple ways with something like tying it or scrunching it or pleating it or folding it so that it resists the dye from penetrating. And shibori is the umbrella term for this resist dye process in Japan. And there are so many kinds of shibori. I, it, it's almost endless. But there's one kind called arashi shibori that I discovered when I was in college in 1979. I was um, privileged to have a lecture with Annalisa Hedstrom uh, for like an hour. She's the queen of Arashi Shibori. And it was an idea that just took off and I was fascinated by it. And the process originally in Japan was wrapping fabric around telephone pole <coughs> sized logs, polished tapered logs. It was a two person job. There was, uh, it was a man's job. There was a trough. It was always indigo. It was always cotton. And the fabric was wrapped around the pole, um, secured with thread or twine or some kind of fiber, and then scrunched until the entire pole was completely covered with um, compressed little pleats of, of cotton. And the original resulting fabric looked like wind um, sheets of wind and rain. And arashi translates to storm in Japanese. So arashi, sheets of wind and rain. This um, process largely died out after World War II, and it was rediscovered in the 70s by Yoshiko Wada, who is Japanese, and discovered a tiny sample book. And she brought the sample book to Fiberworks in Berkeley, opened it to her students and said, let's figure out how they did this. Mm -hmm. So instead of teaching people how to do this process, they did the reverse of trying to figure it out. Annalisa took her workshop, and then I took Annalisa's. So I think, I, I think of myself as basically being a um, third generation Shibori artist. My adaptation, my personal adaptation, is um, no logs. <laughs> um, I used to use wine bottles when I began, jug wine bottles, um, and that was fine, that was great, but there really was just a limited surface that you could use. And then I thought PVS pipe, which is a lot of people use, but I boil my dyes, and that kind of pipe melts in the dye pot. So this is ABS plumbing pipe, and it's available at any hardware store you ever go to. Usually it's like to the ceiling, but they'll cut it for you. And so this is um, what I've been using ever since. When I recycled all those wine bottles, though, it was really embarrassing. <laughs> I'll never forget it, because I had like 50 of them. So anyway, there's two ways that I do my dye. I add color, and I subtract color. And in my wall pieces, which are around the corner here, those wall pieces will have both of those. Oh boy. And I love string, and I, I, like, I like to go to Chinese um, food stores, and they have, you know, anywhere where there's fiber, anything. You could use rickrack. You could use, you could use any ribbon. Yeah, curling ribbon. This is from, uh, it's from a cooking store, and it's thick. So what happens is this is wrapped around, and it resists the dye. This is a thicker string, so the line, the white line, will be thicker. I used to use nothing but the ultra-fine thread, like sewing thread, mm -hmm. and that was fine. <coughs> so, gorgeous. all right, so this is a really good case in point. <clears throat> this is why I quilt. That's the only part that's pretty. All these years. All right. Oh, wow. Oh, now see? Yeah. That went through. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
why, I don't know. Is it just more dipping and more ladling of You know what I think? Liquid? I think that if there's too many layers of the silk and it's tight, it's creating a resist that's, um, so like I might have been nervous about it, so everything was a little tighter when I was doing this. But, um, yeah, but pass that around. So just for a particular kind of silk? I buy my silk at Exotic Silks in Los Santos wholesale. I use silk satin and um, plain silk satin, that's what these are, and then um, black tie silk, which is where we go now for the um, removal of color. Um, black tie silk has a very crisp paper-like quality that allows me to iron in the shapes for um, the, the design very easily with a hot iron. So this one, I think I'll start with this because it's, this is just plain. Um, it's just wrapped smooth, the, the panel wrapped smoothly around a pole, secured with thread, and a magnolia leaf, as you can see. Good thing. Okay, so here's the leaf. And there's what it happens afterwards. That, I like that. That was black. Black. So did you use bleach? <laughs> and see what I like is when it's wrapped around and it has the selvage actually, um, the selvage acts as a resist in a way that I like and it almost looks like panels of bamboo. Look at Hi, hi, why? Now, but I will go around these with um, quilting, which will also be the next, would be the next stage, and that further adds definition to the pieces. Um, I, I could follow the line of the magnolia leaf, and that would emphasize it. And that is really bad. <laughs> what color was this silk when you started? Black. Oh, black, that's right, you said that. I'm sorry. That's really interesting. So that, it just disappeared. The leaf did, but the pattern still stunning. That's why it's, the, luckily that's fun. <laughs> Magnolias can stand up to time. Um, and olive leaves, but again, I don't use ginkgo because they read as ginkgo. Um, I don't know. Because these reads that read as magnolia, so don't listen to anything. <laughs> I like that. Let's see what the layers are. So much serendipity. Oh, so that's interesting. Yeah. So that could be like a scarf. You've got the two ends. Okay, two of the last two. This one would have to be over dyed, probably. As you can see, can you see I'm getting red lines? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's because I used red silk as the, um, the base, base of the silk. So this will be interesting. And I have not peeked. I was tempted. There. See, I'm glad that this is not messy. It will... Oh, that's neat. <laughs> It's interesting because you never go white. It just has a yellowish quality. So I think I would have to over dye it. I'm not keen on that yellow. But I'd have to think about it because if you used it in conjunction with a lot of black, it would, two colors together could be an entirely different thing. This is the awful part. <laughs> okay, but you can see the leaves. Oh, wow. I love I love the blues. So the blues just turns whiter, but you can see it gets darker and darker as it goes underneath. So you may see these again sometime in a piece. <laughs> You're the best audience. Thank you. Thank you so much.